Hello, my name is Tony. The paranormal, parapsychology, telekinesis, clairvoyance, nice girl that Claire. Is there anything in it or is it just a jumbo plate of mumbo served up with lashings of superstition, fakery, illusion and delusion? Hitler believed in it. Okay, maybe not the best example of a stable, well-adjusted personality out there. Let's try again. Some perfectly rational and plausible individuals believe in it. Like, uh, shit, um, help me out, you. Oh, uh, I know, Arthur Conan Doyle, and, of the still living and hailing from the more modern age, Melissa McCarthy, who was no doubt haunted by the ghost of her career after that Ghostbusters reboot, and a lot of other celebrities renowned for drug taking and being practiced in weirdos. Paul McCartney, Sting, Keanu Reeves, Helena Bonham Carter, and Susan Boyle. I'm not really selling it, am I? Let me put it like this. Recently, I might have found something to prove the existence of the paranormal. The answer is mint and tea tree oil shower gel. Try this. You'll like it, my wife advised. Well, no, I fucking didn't, as it happens. Suddenly, with no prior warning, it felt as though my entire asshole was possessed by a ghostly choir bursting into a soundless rendition of Handel's Messiah. Jesus! <laughs> Most haunting experience I've ever had. I'm still not over it. I may never be. Right, I'm sceptical by nature of just about everything. My default setting, scepticalis maximus. But I'm also open-minded. No, it's not a contradiction. There are things in the world for which science has no rational explanation yet. I don't mean like the continued success of Harry Styles and Sam Smith. I mean of a more esoteric nature. And I do think such things are worthy of continued research and exploration to advance the depth and breadth of human knowledge and understanding. My usual disclaimer remains, however, and I quote, so long as it doesn't involve me or cost me any time or money or land me with any grief or inconvenience. Before doing this, I was seriously considering a review of what is without a doubt the greatest paranormal haunted house chiller ever made. Robert Wise's The Haunting from 1963, a close to perfection and creatively untouchable masterpiece of cinematic art. And it's for that very reason I decided to park the idea. That, and I don't feel up to it right now. The Haunting deserves a level of scrupulous care and attention I just don't have the inclination for at the moment. My love and reverence for it might also prove to be a bit of a problem. I haven't got a grip on the right approach, so for that reason, it's off the table. For now though, The Legend of Hell House. It's a personal favourite from back in the good old days of power cuts, three day weeks and widespread social and economic unrest, doom and despondency. To illustrate just how bad things were, The Legend of Hell House cheered me the fuck up. I saw it on a double bill with Witchfinder General. Absolute bonus. It has some passing similarities with The Haunting. The house in The Haunting was called Hill House. It was haunted. History of tragic and fatal events. Change one letter, Hell House. In each instance, a quartet are sent to investigate the paranormal activity. All come under influence of the house and whatever walks within, or in the case of Hell House, sits down within. Both films are based on books, Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House and Richard Matheson's Hell House, respectively. Wise's film truncates Jackson's title to The Haunting, whereas Matheson's is expanded to The Legend of. Okay, that's enough stating the fucking obvious. The Legend of Hell House was helmed by jobbing director John Howe and scripted by Matheson from his own novel. Matheson made some changes, moving the action from Maine to England, which I think is okay, and toning down the more extreme elements of his book, most notably the graphic sexuality and BDSM, which I think is a shame. But then I would, wouldn't I? It was the last film of renowned B-movie and exploitation producer James H. Nicholson, original co-founder of AIP, American International Pictures. He died a year before it was released. It runs something like this. Rudolf Deutsch, millionaire, is reaching the end of his life. He chooses this moment in time to get concerned about the existence of an afterlife. Although he'll find out for himself one way or the other shortly, he wants some reassurance before he pops his clogs. To this end, he employs a small team to investigate the Belasco House, known as the Mount Everest of haunted houses. They will be paid handsomely, but have only the week before Christmas Eve in which to get back to their employer with an answer. The team is headed by physicist Lionel Barrett, Clive Revel, 
travel with his tourist wife Anne Gail Honeycutt in tow and two psychics, mental medium and spiritualist minister Florence Tanner, Pamela Franklin and physical medium Ben Fisher, Roddy McDowell. The backstory of the Belasco house is not exactly the sort of thing you'd want to find associated with an Airbnb you just landed at. Emmerich Belasco was a sadistic and perverted rich guy. He presided over a run-in itinerary of unsavoury sexual and occult events at his gaff. The last one ended in an infamous debauched massacre and his unexplained disappearance thereafter in 1927. General feeling being the house is haunted by the victims of Belasco's twisted and sadistic party nights. Twenty years previously, the last expedition to uncover the secrets of the place resulted in tragedy, the deaths of all members of the team except for a young Fisher who somehow survived. He crawled out of the Belasco house a physical and mental wreck, but he's recovered now, right? Right, yeah, to the point where his personal agenda is to turn up, do nothing for a few days, keep his head down, and when the time's up, leave and collect the paycheck. He's only in it for the money. Whatever is haunting the Belasco house begins insidiously manipulating events with a series of ghostly manifestations and physically dangerous poltergeist phenomena. Barrett is a skeptic, a scientist who rudely dismisses Tanner's belief in surviving personalities after death. He believes that there is nothing in the house other than unfocused electromagnetic energy. He's brought along the components of a machine that once assembled and activated will drain all that energy and cleanse the house of its unholy atmosphere. Despite not being a physical medium, Tanner seemingly manifests physical phenomena, ectoplasm, and, during an argument with Barrett, invisible forces which attack him, from which he deduces she is channeling the energy of the house against him. Fisher is more circumspect, openly admitting he is shielding himself, keeping himself psychically closed off from the energy in the house. He warns that just as he was the only one to survive the last investigation, he will be the only one to do so again. Barrett scoffs at his warnings. He he is a cold, pragmatic egotist who habitually neglects his wife and starves her of attention and affection. Sexually frustrated, she experiences erotic visions which compel her to make sexual advances to Fisher. The second time it happens, Barrett is a witness. Resentful and unreceptive, he ignores Fisher's insistence that the forces in the house are influencing his wife's behaviour and that she is in grave danger. Fisher decides to take the plunge by lowering his psychic defences. Big mistake. He is instantly attacked and racked with intense physical and psychic pain. Tanner comes to believe that one of the surviving personalities is that of Daniel, Belasco's abused and tormented son. She discovers, or is led to, a human skeleton chained up behind a false wall. Believing that a burial service will lay both Daniel's bones and spirit to rest, she and Fisher perform a funeral in the grounds. However, to no avail, Daniel's spirit still haunts Tanner and manipulates her into performing ghostly sexual activity. Whatever the entity is, it's been leading her up the garden path. It brutalises and enters her, taking partial possession of her body and mind. Under the influence, Tanner makes sexual overtures to Fisher, the luck of this fucking guy, and tries to sabotage Barrett's machine. She is prevented from doing any serious damage. She enters the chapel, the heart of the house, where she is crushed to death by a large falling crucifix. Before dying, she draws a symbol with her own blood. After the machine has been switched on, the three survivors leave the house. Once it's done its stuff, they re-enter, and Fisher drops his defences again. He is absolutely absolutely shocked and surprised to find all paranormal activity has ceased. The house is clean, only it's not. Whilst Fisher and Anne pack to leave, Barrett is conducting some last-minute checks. The electromagnetic monitors on his apparatus spring back to life. The monitor panel explodes in his face and he is killed. He is found by Fisher and Anne, nailed to the floor, candlesticks impaling his legs and arms. Fisher decides to uncover and confront the true malevolent spirit of the Belasco house for once and for all. He and Anne venture into the chapel for the film's climax and reveal. The Legend of Hell House is a deliciously nerve-jarring and creepy little opus that is brutally minimalist in approach. It is not ostentatious or showy, relying more on mood and atmosphere in place of pyrotechnical big moments. The mix of elements combined to make it a more memorable film of this type than most. Undeniably, it's a bargain basement affair. There's a cast of seven humans and a cat. Three of the humans appear only fleetingly. One of those is Michael Goch, who went uncredited. 
On first viewing, it's Roddy McDowell's Fisher who makes the most significant impression. The most interesting and layered character, the one with a backstory and a very personal connection with the house itself. Ironically, despite his mercenary attitude and distant demeanour, he turns out to be the hero of the piece. McDowell is excellent, playing it faintly creepy, aloof, slightly camp, but clued into the deal with enough humanitarian facets to generate sympathy and engagement from the audience. Teenage Tony, much the same as adult Tony, if I'm being honest, was very much enamoured of Miss Honeycutt and especially Miss Franklin. Both delightfully provocative hormone stimulants in very different ways. I looked at Clive Revel, saddled with the most unsympathetic character of the four, and then at the lusciously appointed Gail Honeycutt and had a hard time, pardon the pun, believing he'd starve her of attention and abandon her to sexual frustration. Jesus, I might not have been able to satisfy her needs either, but I'd have given it a bloody good go at the very least. Where Honeycutt projects a smouldering image of mature femininity, Franklin is all prim, demure and voluntary sexual repression, very girlish and smartly composed in bearing, prone to foot stamping and tantrums when challenged. She is astonishingly cute with that willowy, early twenty-ish flower child school mom vibe going on, proving that spinsterish chicks can be knockout hot. But more importantly, well almost, the two ladies act it like they mean it and deliver impressive performances. As mentioned earlier, Revel has the most unsympathetic role, the supposed voice of reason, who is more distanced and insulated from the reality of the situation than even Fisher, where Fisher understands all too well the risks Barrett does not. So dogmatic and convinced of his own validity, self-righteous and cocksure, it's quite satisfying when it all goes wrong and quite literally blows up in his face. John Howe directs with little frippery or any hint of an overarching signature style, but he makes good use of cranky angles, shadows and silhouettes to jumpy emotional effect. Necessity, because the budget suited suggestion over explicit special effects. This type of film is all the better for it. It's possibly Howe's best work if I was going to make that sort of judgement, which it seems I have. Certainly light years ahead of Biggles' Adventures in Time. I can't remember now how the hell I got janked into reviewing that. Helping Things Along is a brooding score built around a throbbing electronic bassline with some jarring crashes, thuds and stabs in the background. It was composed by Delia Derbyshire and Brian Hodgson, both used to work for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in the 60s. Derbyshire did the electronic arrangement of the original Doctor Who theme, and Hodgson was responsible for in-program sound effects for that show. He created the sound for the TARDIS, a real original soundtrack collector's item or would be if it was available commercially, which it isn't, so I'm told. The cinematography is by Alan Hume. Later, he lensed for your eyes only, Octopussy, A View to a Kill, and Return of the Jedi. So all you Bond fans and Star Wars slavers can get some idea of what he was up to back in his earlier days. The visuals are grainy, downcast, with a morbid palette and dripping with gothic atmosphere. As an extreme contrast in styles, just take on board that Hume was the cinematographer on a fair few characters. On films. Hell House is right at the other end of that spectrum. On the downside, Matheson's script feels a little bit underwritten, which is most unlike him. All the characters, Fisher accepted, are not really fleshed out or developed much beyond their names being on the tin. This is a work obsessed scientist. This is his neglected wife. Here's a pretty young medium. And here's another medium, only this one has some history, a tale to tell, an agenda, some insight, a deeper understanding. Perhaps budgetary restrictions imposed a trade off between character development and prudent efficiency. Maybe even a designated running time had influence. And it always bothered me that Matheson's novel and its graphic content wasn't more faithfully translated to the screen. The repressed lesbianism, sexual violence, perversity and other elements are all but erased. Hell House was made before the release of The Exorcist. If it had been later, in the aftermath of that film's revolutionary effect on what was thought permissible, things might have been different. I always liked the way it ended, the payoff. Spoilers now then? The entity, it turns out, is one single surviving personality masquerading as many, mimicking others. It's Emmerich Belasco, Michael Goch. Fisher figures this out, guided by the message Tanner left in blood. Belasco was certainly a depraved sadist, but one who was born deformed, with withered legs. He had his lower limbs amputated and replaced with prosthetics to give the impression of height and an imposing physical presence, that of the roaring giant he was reputed to resemble. 
but it was all an illusion. After confronting the entity in the chapel and beating it into retreat with insults, the truth which it can't handle, and his psychic ability, Fisher and Anne find Belasco's perfectly preserved corpse sat in a chair in a lead-lined room secreted behind a stained glass window. Fisher marvels at Belasco's forethought in lining his tomb with lead, anticipating a future science that could potentially destroy the electromagnetic energy his soul or essence had become. The two survivors switch Barrett's machine back on and depart Hell House, presumably to collect their dough and have a very merry Christmas indeed, ho ho ho. If I was Fisher, I'd certainly be entertaining thoughts of roasting my chestnuts on Anne's open fire. <clears throat> right, so the legend of Hell House is not flashy or overburdened with groundbreaking concepts. It's small scale and modest, yet made with some thought and a reasonable idea of how to invoke scares and shocks with relatively convincing practical effects and good old solid unsettling storytelling. It's well acted with an emphasis on just four people in a confined environment that cranks up the claustrophobic tension. The soundtrack becomes the star of the show in generating a sense of almost palpable unease. When I first saw it as a kid I absolutely loved it and Pamela Franklin who became a source of adolescent preoccupation for months along with Gail Honeycutt's sexed up erotically charged come hither moments with Fisher. It doesn't bear any serious comparison with Robert Wise's The Haunting but then why should it? It's good enough as a standalone haunted house flick and the memory of Roddy McDowell shouting Velasco! Velasco! is something that will always stay with me. Love it to death. Thank you for your continued tolerance and indulgence. Do whatever you want to do next. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe, be a patron of my Patreon thing, or make a financial contribution via the thanks button. Always gratefully received. I'll be back soon unless I'm spirited away by spectres, fiddled with by phantoms, or grabbed by the ghoulies. Yowza! You take care now, pilgrims.